Rick Brinair, Executive Director, um, Nellie Marvel, our Admin Services Coordinator. Um, we've got Brandon King with the Department of Liquor and Lottery. We've got David Scher, our General Counsel. We've got one, two, three, four, five members of the public, and we've got Lindsay Wells who um, helps oversee the medical program. So, great. And then we also have Stephanie Smith uh, at the meeting as well. Uh, I think everyone had a chance to review the, the minutes from the meeting on Monday, uh, September 13th. Any questions or edits or comments with the minutes before we approve it? Mark, did you have anything? No? No, no comment. Okay. Uh, making a motion to approve the minutes, and then we'll move on to a pretty full agenda we've got happening today. We're going to take things a lot of order, though, from, from the agenda that I sent. Motion to approve the minutes from Monday the 13th. Gary, you want that motion? <laughs> Tom, I'll uh, make the motion, but abstain from voting because I have not. Uh, gotten through them yet. Okay, we have a motion out there. Anyone want to vote on it? Ashley, any thoughts? <clears throat> Ashley, have you had a chance to review them? Tom, let's just move on. We can ask. We can ask again at the end. I don't know if she stepped away for a second. Yeah, we, we can approve them next meeting as well. Yeah, let's to see what we did. Let, let's just table them and, and we'll look to approve okay. them on Monday. Um, okay. So, uh, because we have some we have some guests and we've got a lot to get through, uh, we're going to deviate a little bit from the agenda that I sent out and hopefully give us some time for uh, Tim Wessel and maybe some others to join us. But uh, to begin with, um, one of the four items that I listed on the priority list was, was seed to sale uh, and, and the tracking and software uh, programs that are out there in other states. And I believe you're, you're already using Trace in Vermont as well. And Kyle, I think you had some information and a guest um, that can provide the subcommittee with some more information? Yeah, Todd, uh, Todd Bailey is with us. He's the interim CEO of Trace Vermont. Um, and I'll let, I'll let Carrie give an overview and, and introduce Todd. I, I haven't had the pleasure of, of, of meeting Todd myself at this point in time. I would I would like to just remind the subcommittee, I know, I know last meeting we did hear from uh, at least one or two committee members about their thoughts on C2CL tracking broadly. And just a reminder that it's in our, legisl our authorizing legislation right now, the board has to um, move on seed to sale tracking. So I'd like to make sure we're just, we're being productive with our time and, and avoiding the pitfalls of that conversation and just looking at what services are available in Vermont and um, you know, getting an overview there and then um, you know, further discussing the pros and cons of other systems, um, you know, if, 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 depending on what happens with, with the conversation today uh, for our future meetings. So without further, um, more talking on my end, Carrie. I'm going to turn it over to you um, as the head of the farm division at the Agency of Agriculture. I know that you have an extensive relationship with with um, some of the features that that Trace does, and I'll I'll let you lead into into introducing to Todd. Very good, Kyle. And if you don't mind, I see Stephanie's here. If Stephanie was here, I'd walk walk you through what we do with Trace. Um, but Stephanie has worked with them extensively to develop the sort of licensing and registration piece. And if you don't mind me. Uh, That's fine. Yeah, whoever is best positioned. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I didn't know you were going to be here, Steph, but since you are, it's perfect because uh, I was working. I was lurking, um, but so surprise. Um, yes. So the, the Agency of Agriculture um, is using uh, the TRACE platform, we call it the Registration and Compliance um, reg uh, System database, 
uh, using that system to register our folks uh, within the agency. Um, we are able, or applicants generally, you can actually see kind of the timestamp for how long it takes for someone to register, and it doesn't take a whole bunch of time, and it takes, you know, five minutes for our staff to actually approve registrations. Um, and but you know, this is limited. This is like we're it's just hemp. We're just mapping areas where cultivation is happening. Um, we are. Uh, documenting the location where processing occurs. Um, we capture information regarding acres or square feet if it's indoor. Um, GPS coordinates. Uh, we are also able to export reports um, based on um, locations, so towns, counties, so on and so forth, so we can find people pretty easily um, when we get a question or concern regarding cultivation in a particular town. Um, we have a relationship with, the, and I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's VIC, um, and they do our credit card processing. However, I know that's probably not going to be available to growers in the cannabis market, um, but we can do cash sheets um, and such. So it's very helpful. Uh, we capture tons of data points using the trace system. And, um, we are working with trace to develop our uh, tracking system for crops, so from harvest lot to process lot, uh, as well as shipping those crops out of state. Again, not applicable to this conversation, um, but it's what we're working on. Uh, and then um, we have the ability for um, designating user access to the system um, so that people can actually go in and check it out but don't have ability to make changes and that's primarily within our, our business um, uh, arm of the agency of agriculture um, so user-based commissions um, let's see here what else do we have uh, or well we're working on that and then we're also working on the the, um, the tracking from harvest lot to process lot uh, to shelf so that's what we do I'm sure Todd Bailey could probably talk more about the system um, I just gave a really, really high level of <laughs> what we're working on. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I appreciate you for, for being here and, and your willingness to, to give us that in-depth overview. Yeah, sure. No, thanks. I, I appreciate it. And, and let me just um, take a step back if I could. Um, I am currently filling a void for Trace in the CEO role because one of the co-founders, Josh Decatur, had moved on. So there currently is an ongoing search for a new CEO. Uh, I've been working with the company since its inception. So at the time, I was most familiar with the inner workings of everything that the company does. So I agreed to just step into that role in a very short-term basis in order to keep everything moving forward as they conducted that search. And in part, that's because of the other role that I want to make everyone aware of. I am a partner in a public affairs firm in Vermont, Lee and I Public Affairs. Uh, I served as the president of government affairs for our firm for a number of years and represented Trace in the state of Vermont as their lobbyist. So when my relationship started with Trace, I was representing them on the government affairs side and have been doing that work, like I said, from the time that the company was founded and have become very familiar with the company. So uh, this role that I'm filling now is, is very much um, something that I'm just gonna step in and try to help them out as they as they do this full search. And I just wanted to make everybody aware of that, that circumstance. Most notably, my role at Lee and I, uh, so that was clear for every committee member or subcommittee member and person in attendance. Um, and I think, you know, I, I've been tracking this conversation some. I don't live in Vermont any longer. Uh, I still partner with the firm that I mentioned earlier, Lee and I Public Affairs, uh, but I live in Philadelphia. So I have been tracking this conversation from a distance. Um, so pardon me if there are some details though that I, that I have missed in regard to your current dialogue around track and trace. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, a lot of the features that are currently being implemented and currently being developed in parallel with the hemp program. Um, they are similar features and functions that could easily be adapted to a REC uh, program. Um, I think it's really important for everybody to really kind of understand the origins of Trace and how we got to where we are. Uh, the co-founders, Josh Decatur and Paul Intellect, 
were very much focused on both the hemp side of the cannabis industry, but also the marijuana side of the cannabis industry, most specifically based on their backgrounds of working for or grow operations as technical developers on the craft cultivator, the small business. Um, it was with that in mind that they kind of developed the theory around how track and trace would work through their particular features. And that was designed to be simple, affordable, easy, uh, because what we were seeing in the industry was these very large companies that had created a system for track and trace for regulators that was very complicated, very burdensome, very expensive, uh, most of them requiring RFID chips to do tracking at the individual plant basis. And so what our philosophy was on track and trace was how do we make this much easier while still getting all of the relevant data for regulators, whether that be wanting to track and trace and ensure that diversion was not occurring or if it was quality control, uh, what lab results might be, um, and that can be done at an individual plant basis through a QR code, which is much less expensive than an RFID chip, um, actually costing the, the grower nothing in most instances, depending on the size of the operation, but can still provide all of the data that would be required for a thorough track and trace system for state regulators. And I think the way that we really like to talk about what we do is to think about this as um, if you were mailing a package from Montpelier to Brattleboro and that package needs to be tracked from the place of origin to the place of delivery but had to stop at every post office along the way, how would you track what happened when it stopped at each of those post offices? So if you thought about Montpelier, the origin being the seed, we would track that seed and we would start this process. And then as the package made its way south to say Berlin, that was where you were harvesting. And we would track what was your harvest yield, and we would be able to show that data to regulators through a dashboard that that is actually applicable right now, and you could take a look at to some degree uh, with the hemp track and trace system that's currently in place in the state of Vermont. As it made its way further, it would be going to the lab. We would track that, what well, shipped to the lab, what those test results were, and again, that regulator would have a dashboard that they could open up and take a look at and have all of the relevant data that they need or that the regulators have decided was the priority for the program. Um, and then you just think about that through the next phases of track and trace, through that supply chain, and every stop that it makes, the, the simple solution is you are taking out your phone, you have an app, you scan that QR code and all of the relevant data at that point in time, whether it be for um, extraction, for lab data, for flower sale, for retail, whatever the case may be, you simply scan that QR code and all of that data is gonna be available to uh, the regulators, the um, industry, whatever the uh, small businesses that is actually holding the product at that time. Um, the consumer could see that data as well. So when we think about trace, uh, we're thinking very much in the same way that, that our competitors work on track and trace, the, the, the names that probably everybody knows, Metrics, MA, uh, Metric, MJ Freeway, Biotrack, THC. Similar, but with a very specific focus on cannabis and most notably small businesses in the cannabis industry. So that's really what makes trace different and, and more unique, I think, than some of the other options that are currently available. Um, I just wanna touch, go back real quick, because I think it will be really relevant to the rec market when it's up and operating, was something that uh, Stephanie Smith uh, referenced, which was the mapping tool. Um, because I think we're all hoping that in Vermont, there's a very robust craft cultivator community, a very small business community in the cannabis industry. One of the features that Trace developed for the hemp industry is a mapping feature where you simply go on the Google Maps, you click the quadrants for where the hemp is going to be grown. Uh, you click on another data point where the entrance to the farm would be located, for instance. So the regulators need to have access to that hemp field. So this is the area in that field where they could drive in. And that map feature is also something that's unique for Trace and that we could we can create that map for craft cultivators if there's gonna be a grow operation, whether it's a physical structure or an outdoor grow, uh, if that is going to be allowed, you would be able to go in and create this map very simply 
and have regulators understand exactly where that grow operation is occurring for purposes of either showing up on site to do regulatory checks or uh, if public safety needs to go for whatever reason or any other instance where you would need to check that particular operation. Um, I'll pause there in case there are any questions or someone wants to weigh in. Stephanie, I see your hands up, feel free. No, I just wanted to add um, within the, the HEM system that's um, that we're building uh, associated with the, the tracking and tracing of the harvest lot through process lot is that we, you can only transfer that lot internally um, in the state to someone that's registered within the program. So there's that kind of added layer of protection until it becomes a product that meets a um, that THC requirement. Again, we're talking about hemp. Um, but we also have the ability to transfer that um, that flower, that harvest, um, out of state uh, to other uh, growers. But within our state, we're tracking who's registered and who's receiving that. Yeah, just so just to add that is the security level that that a track and trace system like Trace puts in place, so that you know at every given point where there's a drop off and pickup that the ownership of that particular product, whatever phase that it may be in, is then uh, verified by the entities making the transfer and the regulators can see that transfer has taken place. So you'll be able to look at a system and very easily identify where is this cannabis now and where is it in the process of making it from seed to shelf. Todd, is, the, is it worth mentioning that the, sort of the blockchain piece yeah, I mean, I think. Sorry, Carrie. Were you, was there more? I don't know if that's that's important for this crowd or not, but it is something that's unique. Yeah. I, so when when Trace was originally founded, it was uh, based on the Ethereum block blockchain um, as an additional layer of security, and it may be or may not be something uh, that the state of Vermont wants to implement for the REC program as well. Obviously. Um, uh, we've heard a lot about blockchain and practical uses for blockchain. Uh, seed to sale tracking is one of the most practical um, because it's the data is less likely to be corrupted. So anytime that any blockchain data is altered or edited in any way, um, that data isn't erased like can happen in some traditional databases. You can actually see the alteration of that data. So if there was a mistake and somebody went back and changed something, you're going to see all of that live. Um, it is more expensive to do it that way, and we are very much appreciative of the fact that there's also a cost component to implementing a seed to sale tracking uh, solution for the state of Vermont, for the craft cultivators, and for the MSOs. So it is an option that we can develop on the blockchain if it is something that folks were interested in for that additional layer of security. It is not something that has to be done or can is mandatory for the trace product to function well, um, we have it set up so that we can um, create a system that, as I mentioned, is really simplistic in the sense of do the regulators want craft cultivators to continue to, as is the common place for all the other states, track at the individual plant basis and require every grower, regardless of size, track at every plant basis. Trace can handle that tracking through the QR code system. If the regulators decide, hey, you know what, some of these operations are very small, there's not going to be that large of an operation that we need to worry too much about all of the little details at the plant level. We can just do this as a lot or batch based tracking. Trace has been set up to do that. As, as you may recall, you know, the, the impetus of Trace was to really help the small farmer. And so we created the system as a way, and the way that it works with hemp, it's lots, it's batches, it's not at the individual plant. That would be impossible for some of the larger growers and and the resources that are needed to, to grow hemp. So what we do what we do is we we are going to be able to track the lot or batch base, and we can implement a system just as easily for the rec program at that lot or batch base, depending on the regulatory uh, provisions and, and the regulator's preference. But if you also then decide, hey, you know what, we we really think that we're going to go with a system like the other states are currently implementing, and we want it at the plant level regardless of size, we have that capability as well through our unique QR code system of tracking. Thank, thank you, Todd. Um, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Stephanie. I know you said that a majority. You, you've you've mentioned to me and I think to the sustainability committee earlier today that a majority of your hemp registrants are planning on a half an acre or less, right? So there's a lot of small cultivators that are that are in the trace system. Todd, as part of you may or may not know this, as part of our uh, authorizing legislation, we are tasked with making accommodations for small craft cultivator cultivators. So you know I think. It sounds really great that um, the trace is, has that focus, bringing to it from a seed to sale tracking perspective. Because I think the board was interested in whether or not, um, you know, what, what, would it make sense to do any exemptions from seed to sale tracking for small cultivators? But I'm sensing that if if this were a direction that the subcommittee and the board went, that you know, it might all be, you know, gravy from that perspective. Stephanie, I, I didn't know if you had any thoughts for, you know, what you're seeing from your. Uh, license holders on on using trace and then i'd love to get ashley's perspective if she's willing to share if she has any thoughts um, before we we take this in the cultivation route um i have one more th i mean you know just based on our experience it was you moving from the legacy folks that um because we had a program before using paper-based applications and moving to a database, click, you know, lots of um, functionality, um, that transition was difficult. So my only thing that I want to share with the board is have a system before you start issuing licenses because that transition can be difficult just from an experience, you know, standpoint. <laughs> um, uh, but that has nothing to do with Trace. That's just a recommendation. Um, the one thing that I wanted to add relative to um, using the system as well is that um, when we get to a point where we're you know, robustly enforcing our um, Vermont brand uh, within our hemp rules, the information that we collect or that we expect to collect um, once we launch um, that portion of the development of the application um, with Trace, we will be able to, we will get all the information we need in order to make those determinations. We'll have labels, we'll be able to do label reviews, we'll know where the crop was grown, we'll know where it's processed, because all that information is being collected within the system. Um, so I, I wanted to add that as well, uh, because I know that the, there is interest in um, generally, you know, being able to stand up a, a Vermont craft brand um, relative to, to cannabis, um, similar to what we're trying to do in the hemp program. Um, and then just general experiences, um, you know, despite a little bit of frustration for the transition, understandably, because you're being forced to do something different uh, from paper to um, a database and computer-based applications, uh, generally, it, you know, it's, again, quick. Folks can get in there and register fairly quickly. So, uh, but I would be interested in hearing from Ashley. <laughs> yes, please, Ashley, do you have any thoughts? Hi guys. Um, so this is maybe a stupid question, but um, given the current nature of where things are set for actual licensed cultivars in Vermont, where are their seeds coming from? Are we saying we're starting this trace at the plant, right? Like actually it's being grown, it's happening, then we're starting the process. Where are they getting the seeds to begin with? These are coming from Vermont cultivars to start with? Am I asking a stupid question here? No, no. They, actually, my understanding is, is, is they could be, or, or they could be from from clones, and then after you get um, your business running, you you can create your own seed. So it, it could be from different kind of from. So, so, so step one is there is a nursery being created, and people are given licenses for nurseries to start these clones. Then once that's underway, then we're distributing these clones, and then we're taking the trace from there. Ash, this is Carrie behind. The nursery generating the clones could also log in to trace currently, create the QR code that moves with it throughout the system. So you know that, okay, it, it, that, makes, that makes more sense to me. And then is that, from your perspective, Kyle, like, is that what you think is going to suffice? Is that is enough of a level of tracking starting there? Well, I'd love to hear the board's, or the, excuse me, the subcommittee's thoughts on that, I think, as, as we weigh seed to sale. Well, okay, so that's, that's where I feel like there's going to be a large stumbling block of 
getting these small cultivars up off the ground in competition with anybody who's already doing, you know, um, indoor grows for MSOs. Like, are, is there going to be any ability to, you know, have some kind of partnership for, with those guys who are already underway and doing this type of um, cloning to begin with? I just feel like it's going to put the small guys at a disadvantage to getting this up and running. Todd, if you have a response to that, that would be great. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah. These are, the, these are the, the issues I think that we need to tease out here. Um, recognizing that we're, again, we have to we have to move on a seed to sell tracking platform. But recognizing what that means for small cultivators and how we can take those missteps that might inevitably play out in real time and do account as much as we can uh, now in the planning stage. But Todd, feel, feel free to answer. Yeah, I just want to add from a technical perspective, obviously not weighing in specifically on which regulation you all determine is the best way to proceed, but from a trace perspective on tracking the plant, regardless of what phase that plant is in its growth, whether it be the seed or a clone or a somewhat even mature plant, the you will be able to create a data point within the trace system to initiate a track from any point in that plant's process. So if you were to decide, say, um, look, some of the cultivators have semi-mature or even mature plants as this program launches already, how are we going to track that? There is going to be some requirement of actual physical data input into the system. But once that data is included into the trace system for tracking, it'll all be attached to that QR code. So from that point forward, it'll always live with those plants or with that batch. So as you as you theorize on what system is going to be best for the state of Vermont and craft cultivators, I think the important part of this is that I want you all to understand that regardless of when you let craft cultivators enter the system, enter the market, regardless of where their plants are, Trace will have the capability of tracking it from that point and even backdating some of the data on, on the origins of that plant moving forward so that you'll always have a clear picture still in year one of where your product is, is coming from and what is making up the cannabis industry in the state of Vermont. Thanks, Todd. Okay, I've got another question for you, Todd. Um, so along those chains, the supply chain, I'm looking at it's being grown. Okay, now it's being ready to be harvested. Now it's going to be trimmed. Now it's going to be processed. Now it's going to be tested. At what point are these checkpoints? Like maybe can you could walk me through what you've done for seed to sales, like how often are tests occurring? How often is there a checkpoint? What information do you get at every step of that point? Or, that, so rather than it's just going from, you know, growing to the shelf, like can you just walk me through how many times it gets tested and at what points you can look and scan that code and get the certain information you're looking for? The, the, the reality of that answer is really whatever the regulators decide. If, if, if regulators decide they want to do a test every two weeks, no matter what the phase of the plan is in, then we would have all of that data, all that data, and there would be a new data point. Um, in the traditional sense, it's really um, it, what, what we're really talking about is either seed or clone, um, at some point testing, some point harvest and testing again, um, processing, which may include extraction or, or secondary products, depending on what the program allows, edibles, and so on and so forth, flour, um, shipment, and transfer to the retail dispensary. Again, another question of structure for you all to decide. It, it really truly will not uh, influence Trace's capabilities of delivering a track and trace system. Is it a farmer's market? Is it a farm stand? Is it a, a physical location? We will be able to have all of that data tracked at every transfer, regardless of how many points there are and what you decide each point is along the supply chain. And Todd, knowing the Vermont landscape and how it currently sits, who, if you don't mind, who do you think is a good option for testing? I mean, we have a handful here in the state. We've got FIA. You know, if we're going to be outsourcing any of the testing, are we thinking about, um, I mean, are we going to be allowed to implement from other um, out-of-state out testing facilities? Are we thinking that our current processors are going to become a testing facility? Do, 
do we know that yet? Are we thinking about that yet? Because without that, this is really a futile effort. Ashley, I think I think Carrie's jumping to, to answer that question. We do have a lab testing and product safety committee. Um, Carrie's spearheading that committee right. that's that's looking at um, um, our existing hemp lab standards and also pulling from other jurisdictions to see what they're doing. Carrie, I would ask if you could keep your answer short so we can we can keep this rolling because we're the hour's getting away from us. Yep. Yep. No problem, Ashley. One of the issues we're trying to tackle is sort of subsidizing growing or subsidizing testing for small growers so what would a private public partnership look like with a lab so we could have state inspectors collecting samples but running it through a commercial lab um, without excess fees going to the growers because if you look at the suite of tests um, it's important that it get tested for uh, consumer protection but to put all the um, financial liability on the growers for that test is I, I think un testing is untenable so we're banging our heads together to develop a model that testing is the foundation of the consumer protection program but trying to alleviate some of the financial responsibility of the growers and we're not final on that proposal yet and as soon as it is i'll share it with you well, i appreciate um, that because it's already so expensive just the way that we're doing it in the hemp model it's like batch to batch it's it's already i in my opinion i think it's astronomically expensive um and obviously that's just because there's so few testing entities that are credible enough to give us those um different contaminants and consumer safety we're looking for yep Yep, I agree, and it needs to be, that cost for testing needs to be shared over the entire entire license, licensed regulated community and not just placed on the growers. And uh, it would be an innovative model for the country, but it doesn't really exist here yet. We're uh, banging our heads together, like I said, and trying to come up with something that works. Carrie, it's, it's actually a good segue into talking about cultivation, but before we do that, Todd, Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you being here. I mean, you get, you're welcome to stay on the rest of the, the call. Um, hold on one second, Tom. And then, um, Todd, I know uh, what would be helpful for, I think, the subcommittee and the board, and I don't want to put you on the spot now, but if you can get information to us on you know, what you think um, something like this would cost the state of Vermont and the Cannabis Control Board, and I recognize that that probably depends on different functionalities that we would want as a board, but, but understanding what resources would be needed from us to potentially move in this direction would be helpful. Yeah, no, that, that's no problem. If I could just make a couple more quick quick points. I just, I, I didn't um, talk about the integration between the, the market and the state regulators, and I just want to make sure everybody understands that's an API, super easy plug in, transfer the data. Doesn't mean that cultivators or businesses have to use Trace. They can use any inventory tracking system that they prefer, and I, I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of that because I don't want anyone to leave with the impression that people are, are gonna be captured by Trace if Trace is the solution. Um, I'm happy to kind of do uh, that request and, and look at it. I, it does really depend a lot on features and a lot of it is also, um, I would ask a question back to keep in consideration that our competitors all use an RFID chip system and they pass that expense on to the cultivators, on to the businesses. And so that doesn't often get captured in what the overall cost is to the state. It gets caught, does capture what the price tag is for the state of Vermont government, but not the overall cost of the program. But I'm happy to work through some of that. And then one, just one last small point. Um, Stephanie mentioned BIC. That is also a client of my firm. So I just want to make it perfectly clear that's Vermont Information Consortium that processes all the credit cards and just wanted to make sure, wanted to make sure everybody had that information. Thank you, Todd. Tom, were you, were you trying to jump in there? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I apologize. I, I know, <laughs> you know we've only got nine minutes left and, and we still have cultivation and enforceability. I actually have probably four or five questions just going through and developing seed to sale regulations um, for Todd, but uh, I'm just trying to figure out, I mean, it's not about testing, it, it, it's about seed to sale specifically. I, I don't know if it'd be more productive if I just had that conversation with Todd or if everyone one of the benefit of, of kind of the questions I had more about seed to sale and, and the programming in, in general. I'll I'll leave it up to you. If you can if you can do it quick, how about how about 
Mike, are we going to have any public comments? Bernie? No. No? Any public comments? All right, I think I just bought us nine minutes, Tom. So why don't you um, <laughs> why don't you go ahead and ask your questions quickly while we have Todd, and, and then I okay. I do want to um, talk to Carrie about uh, cultivation, yeah. get information about how his division handles pesticides, because I know that feeds into testing and that feeds into a lot of costs that Ashley had mentioned earlier before we talk about enforcement. And I think one of the things I want to scope here, and I think I, I wish that Ingrid and Tim were here um, to hear me say this and for the benefit of, of the subcommittee, what other information do subcommittees feel like they need in order to make an educated up or down vote on whether or not the, the board should consider moving forward um, with a relationship through an MOU or something else with the Agency of Agriculture to help us on cultivation enforcement and compliance. So sure. go, go for it, Tom. Okay. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate you staying on just a little bit. I mean, the, the first one is you, you really addressed it. I was going to ask about um, the API. Uh, but just overall, the, the process ultimately is still based on, on data entry. Um, and then how that, how, how Trace interfacts, it interacts with the API and how open that is. Um, because when, when Ashley was asking, well, how does this get started? Ultimately, it's going to be up to the license holder to, to enter that, that data in first. I'm not a software engineer uh, by any means, but um, I mean, it's it, to an extent, it, it is garbage in, garbage out, right? And I'm, I'm looking at the veracity of the system and the verification that the board's ultimately going to need. But you, can you just comment on that and, and how um, how the data entry from the license holders and, and from these real retailers will will maybe interact with that API and, and how open that process can be to the board? Yeah, so I think on the question of transparency and openness, it was full transparency. The, the board and, and the regulators will be able to see everything, essentially. So um, we want to make sure that the system, and, and, and again, part of the beauty of blockchain, even though this may not be a blockchain system, is more openness. Um, because the security around it is tighter, you can be more open with your data. So this would be this would be a completely transparent system where the regulators would look at, at everything. Um, it would all be on your dashboard. And so yes, you are correct, garbage in, garbage out. You know, they're, they're part of the way that the tracking systems will work is really dependent upon um, individual plant tracking or batch or lot tracking, right? So if we take the, the batch or lot tracking system, what we're going to be dependent upon are trends that are created over longer periods of time, right? So you're going to have to rely on, if this individual had 250 square feet of grow uh, operation, what was their yield and what was produced and how does that compare from year after year, but also against other people that are, are growing at the same level or even a little slightly larger, you know, 500, it's double. What's their yield? Why are these differences? You'll be able to examine that much more closely and understand whether or not this was a data entry uh, problem or was this a, a, a grow technique? Like, so, so there might be questions from regulators. Why did the 500 square foot operation have four times the yield that the 250 square foot operation had? You're gonna to wanna to look at that. And that's going to lead to questions, and you'll better understand was was the data wrong? Was the lighting system poor? Was it whatever? You'll, you'll have questions, and regulators will be able to get to the bottom of that. But to the root of your comment, yes, you're absolutely right. You're going to be dependent upon that initial data entry point, especially because the way that the features will work, and what we're very very close to wrapping up. If Stephanie's still on, she might have a better sense than even I do of exactly where we are. It's like a lab feature, for instance. You send it off, it's tested. The test is gonna automatically be linked to the QR code. It's not going to be something where someone sits in the lab and, and types in that. That's gonna, it's just gonna spit it out. This is the result, there it is. So that's gonna be great data in and great data out. And we're trying to build a system to have it function that way as much as possible. Thanks, and then Todd, I, I'll, I'll just combine this, my second question in a, I guess three or four parts, but I mean, what, what I'm seeing from other states and, and how other CDCL software has, has failed, and um, I mean, you're looking at mostly delays for whatever reason, either slow connections, or it sounds like there's a lot of issues with um, just slow updates and slow slow rollouts. Then obviously, and, and you know, every industry is 
uh, has this problem, but, but security breaches. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure, um, I, I don't know if, to what level you've experienced that, uh, hopefully not in Vermont at all, but could you just comment on maybe how often, you know, you've had to see, had to experience, you know, updates or getting updates out to the, the license holders or, or the state governments, um, you know, connection, kind of troubleshooting problems and, and security breaches? Yeah, so um, on security breaches, nothing to my knowledge. And so some of my hesitation is a little bit, I'm also not a software developer, I'm not a tech expert. And so some of these I may want to defer to our CTO, Chris Babcock, and get you a more thorough answer. Um, because I don't want to dive into something and, and mislead you on that information, exactly how that works. I will say this, and I think in full transparency, Trace was a startup. Um, it is a startup. And we won the Vermont contract for Hemp Track and Trace. We were the first in the nation to have a Hemp Track and Trace system uh, and a contract awarded for that system. We had road bumps out of the gate. There's no denying it. Um, it, it, it happened. And some, some of that was bugs and doing the updates and getting that done. Um, and in the time since we've been in operation, brought Chris Babcock on as the CTO, and I feel like he's cleaned up that quite a bit. On the technical front, in regard to the numbers of bugs and how they've been resolved and what they are, I don't want to get into that more deeply because I may misrepresent what the situation is because I am not a technical expert. So I will be happy to pass this question along to Chris and get you all a more thorough answer. I would uh, suggest instead of just answering those questions, um, at a future meeting, we get a 15, 20 minute demonstration um, because a picture's worth a thousand words and some of Ashley's questions, I think will be addressed if you were able to show what the current software capabilities or future capabilities are uh, proposed to be. That, that would be great. We would love to have that opportunity to do that. Um, and I think that we can demonstrate thoroughly and address a lot of, of the questions that you're raising, Tom, um, through that process. And, you know, I, because I think that this is, a, this is an issue in the industry. I, I mean, Massachusetts, just this week, put out an RFI to replace their vendor um, with two years remaining on the contract because of a lot of the issues that you just raised. Um, so, you know, when a state is, is threatening to um, terminate a contract two years early, you know there are problems, and, and there are a lot. Thanks, Todd. I'd love to get you back with your team, get a demonstration, and we can, we can figure out scheduling for that. Um, not in the final 10 minutes of this, this conversation. Um, yeah. Our, just for comment, um, here as a regulator and moving towards track and trace as a consumer protection component of a program, as opposed to a diversion prevention component of the program, I think tracking by lot, so say a nursery does cut 100 clones, uh, enters that into the system, there's a QR code generated. If that information follows, 50 clones went to um, Elmore Mountain, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, and then- All good, clones. no, it's all good. <laughs> so, so those QR codes separate, but they all trade back the, uh, to the original lot or to the original nursery that uh, cut and sold those clones. So the system was designed to track whole lots, but also separate partial lots and, and where those all went to. So, you know, a nursery maybe cuts a thousand clones and a hundred go to ten different growers, um, all trackable through the QR code. Yep. You just create sub lot, split them up, and track yeah. them. As neatly and tightly as, as if it was a thousand and one group. And in my head, sort of every pesticide application gets added to that law under the QR code. So a, a consumer buying a product in the marketplace in Colorado, they pull the pesticides used on a label. This would get tracked through a track and trace system. So every pesticide application is recorded on that law when it was harvest, harvest where it gets processed. It's, it's information tracking, um, 
and information it also for you know not only regulatory component but also a marketing component sure and consumer awareness which was pitched to us in the hemp program um, we're not completely there yet um, and some of that's attributable to, to sort of COVID um, lockdown and slowdown but um, Steph and I can both speak to the registration piece and we'll leave it to Todd and his crew to talk about uh, capabilities of the track and trace. Carrie, can I just ask you one quick question? Um, I don't know if my eyes are playing tricks on me or if this was something that I've just kind of been hearing, but are we requiring processors to be ISO certified? Processors, no. Okay, and, great. But I'm gonna let Steph answer. Uh, there is some, we are encouraging labs to be ISO or moving towards the ISO third party certification um, just for that extra level of accountability. But um, that hasn't been discussed for processors. I don't want to move too yes. deep into the to the program, Stephanie. If you can, if you can be quick. That would be great. We only have seven minutes left. I have nothing to add. Okay. Um, Carrie, you did touch a little bit on pesticide usage and how something like that could be incorporated into seed to sale tracking. So I'm using that as our jump off transitional point for you to kind of, um, it's hard to talk about what you can do from a cultivation perspective um, from the agency of agriculture uh, in seven minutes, but I'd love for you to take your, your best shot. Yeah, so right now we do have one hemp inspector and we do have, um, potentially five or six other field inspectors. I have an open position. And Mike does hemp exclusively, but the other folks are trained to do pesticide inspections, nursery inspections, all the other components that um, would be required in a cannabis program. So they, they have expertise in that arena already. The pesticide inspection, the worker protection piece because of the pesticide use as well as nursery. Um, currently expertise in that arena, not knowing the size of the industry. Um, it's hard to make a prediction, but I think we're getting close to coming up with knowing what that um, size is. So I would be able to better give you an idea about how many more inspectors it would take in order to be able to support the program. Yeah, that would be great. I know we've, we've talked about that um, previously. Um, I think what would be helpful over the course of the next couple meetings is for uh, the subcommittee to think what else, and I know, and we, we should communicate this to the subcommittee members that are not here, Ingrid and Tim. Um, we've heard at multiple meetings about the Agency of Agriculture's capabilities when it comes to compliance and enforcement, what else they feel like they need to see in order to um, give a comfortable recommendation to the board on whether or not we should move in that direction. So um, I think we can, uh, Brian, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking out loud. What's the best way to get that information, do you think, to the other subcommittee members that might not be here with us today for them to feel comfortable? I mean, I think the best way would be in some sort of written format, if we can do a summary that we can just provide to all of the uh, advisory committee so that they can all review it and take it take it into account during their own work on their own subcommittees. That would be easiest. I don't want to lay yeah. a whole bunch more work on on people, but um, I think I, that would be. I nice. agree, and I, and I do know for, for the subcommittee's reference, um, we do have the Department of Liquor and Lottery in the room, and I think somebody from Liquor and Lottery will be willing to come and talk to the committee next week about their capabilities and give a presentation and then hopefully do a similar up or down yes no vote on whether or not it makes sense for the board to pursue um, an MOU with the, the Department of Liquor and the Department, right, or Division? Department. Department. <laughs> Sorry, we um, um, to, to, to help us on the retail end of enforcement here. So um, I'm hoping next week that this subcommittee can start to give the board um, some direction and we can start moving down the priority list. I know that in the last market structure meeting, a lot of, lot of concerns around security. So Tom, maybe it might make sense to bump that up our um, uh, priority list. 
Yeah, I, I, I was there for that. Um, I heard it, and it, it is surrounded around a lot of the, the cash management and banking um, as, as well, uh, which is on the list. Uh, and I want an opportunity to, to kind of answer Sivan. Um, sure. But I, I think it will be mostly cash management, so uh, uh, I'm with you. I, I understand. Yeah, so I'm hopeful next week we can start checking off some boxes here, get get the ball rolling at the board at the board level for consideration and start moving down because I think security cash management, um, that was a big part of it, but also just physical security at different license types that they're exploring in that committee, like the limited use, or what was it, limited something license for like the general store model and also the, the yeah. farm gate model and what different security will look like depending on the license type. So limited location. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you heard my, my comment there, Kyle, but for that limited use, I mean buffer zones are also within this committee. And right. I said that's gonna that's gonna conflict with it's gonna be a challenge. Um, great. The only uh, the only thing Tom I'd, I'd ask of, of you and your colleagues at NACB that might help facilitate some some more um, some more you know some more progress next week is on local ordinances and fees. I know Tim wasn't able to join us here, and I really want to get his perspective on certain things. What might be helpful is if you could help the subcommittee dig up some some model ordinances from other Dillon states that have a legalized market. What uh, what are other localities doing? Um, at that you know municipal or county level and I recognize we're gonna have to take something whatever we can do and, and kind of right size it to what Vermont does and how we do it here but having some point of reference for those model ordinances will certainly be helpful to the extent that, that you mark and, and Gina and whoever else um, at NACB might be able to, to dig up some stuff for us yeah understood and we started that process awesome thank you um, I think I think that's it. Ashley, any, any further thoughts? No, I like the direction we're headed. I feel like we actually have a focus here. I'm excited for two presentations, both for Trace and from um, Liquor and License. So I'm, I'm excited to see that to really get a better idea of how we're going to do this. So yeah, we'll, we'll try, yeah, we'll try and get it all get it all moving next week. So um, Tom, I think we can we can move to to adjourn. I so move. We'll see you all on Monday. That's right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thanks, everybody.